I can't knock out a book in three months like some authors can. Yeah. Like I cannot do that. It is not possible for me to do that. And so if I'm going to yeah. devote 15 months of my brain's process, creative processing power to a project, like I better want to do it. Just a quick note before we get into the episode. If you would like to work with me one-on-one -on -one to improve your book and become a better writer, I'm really excited to say that I'm currently offering a limited number of freelance book editing slots. Go to jedhern.com forward slash editing to see the full details and apply to work with me today. Here's what a previous client said about my editing. Hi, my name is Gabriel Bergmoser. I'm the author of The Hunted, The Inheritance, and The True Color of a Little White Lie. On several different occasions, including two of the aforementioned manuscripts, I've approached Jed Hearn for editorial help, which he has provided and then some. Jed has provided some really enormously beneficial in-depth analysis of the projects at hand, uh, helping to show me and guide me towards what works and what doesn't work, and providing an invaluable outside perspective of somebody who really, truly understands story on a very, very deep level. I could not recommend his services highly enough, if you get the chance to work with him, absolutely go for it because you will not regret it. So if you'd like to uh, work with me and find out more details about my editing, go to jedhern.com forward slash editing. Now, on to the episode. Hello and welcome to Wizards, Warriors and Words, a fantasy writing advice podcast. I'm Jed Hearn, author of Across the Broken Stars, and I'm joined by my fellow writers, starting with Dirk Ashton. Hello, everybody. I am Dirk Ashton regardless of what anybody might say. And I wrote the Paternus trilogy, regardless of what Mike might say. And our other writer is Michael R. Fletcher. Hey, uh, that's me, author of uh, the Obsidian Path <laughs> trilogy. We'll go with that one today, because why not? <laughs> and we are joined by a very special guest, Peter V. Brett. Peter, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Peter V. Brett, author of the Demon Cycle series from Delray Books. Uh, Demon Cycle is published in 26 languages worldwide. Um, and uh, my first book in my next series, The Nightfall Saga, uh, The Desert Prince, came out last year in hardcover, but it comes out next week in paperback. Oh, perfect awesome. timing. So by the time this episode goes live, yeah. that book will be available, which is awesome. August 16th. And um, it's on the 16th. Okay, yeah, yeah. it'll definitely... Uh, be up by the time you are listening or watching to this and that's, that's uh you're being a bit humble timing. with that introduction yeah you're being a bit humble with that introduction Planned it I all came across a stat the other day that said you have sold over three and a half million books is that correct good god uh the, i mean that like uh over the course of <laughs> seven novels yes so like uh that's impressive. Not, uh very that's pretty good very impressive <laughs> I, uh, I sleep good at night. <laughs> um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. We've done this in the past where we do like a interrogation style episode. Um, so probably the best place to start is for people who aren't familiar with the Demon Cycle uh, series. Do you want to just give us the kind of brief pitch for that so that we can set some context? Uh, okay, so the Demon Cycle series is set in a world where uh, demons rise up from the ground each night, and um, the demons are sort of uh, supernatural creatures. They're immune to, to normal weapons, and they basically just ravage the land until the sun comes up and drives them away again. And the only way to protect yourself from these creatures is to draw magical symbols called wards around your home or your crops or your... Uh, uh, property in order to keep the demons back sort of like holding up a cross to a vampire um and so uh when the demons came back they burned all the libraries and sort of destroyed a modern world not unlike our own uh and reduced it back to little house on the prairie level of technology and so people are sort of living in these isolated communities surrounded by these magic symbols, but they can't really travel from place to place because if you're caught out at night, the demons come and kill you. And so that's where we enter into the world. Um, the human race is almost extinct. Um, and then we're introduced to three children, um, each of whom is sort of scarred by a demon encounter in their childhood. And it changes the course of their life in such a way that they, uh, learn a way to fight back and resist demons each in their own each in their own different way and then uh 
these characters eventually meet each other and they have many adventures and it's very exciting. What are the, uh, oh, sorry, Derek, you go. Did you have a question? Awesome. No, no, I just said awesome. <laughs> um, we've usually got a fourth uh, co-host for this, Rob, who can't make this episode, but he sent through a couple of questions that I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Demon Cycle. Um, and this is from Rob. He says that you did an excellent job of setting up multiple sides of the conflict in your books. Uh, and he said that it kind of made both the opposing human forces seem quite reasonable. Um, and it even made him like kind of empathize with a bit of a dictator character. Uh, so... For Rob, that was kind of one of the most compelling aspects of the book was like making sort of all perspectives feel quite quite valid and interesting in their own way. So how did you kind of like go about achieving this? And was that one of the big intentions that you had leading into the series? Uh, So I, I think that this was a reaction to the sort of broad strokes fantasy that I used to read as a kid where like, you know, well, it's a goblin, so obviously it's evil and it doesn't matter if we slaughter them all, you know, uh, or like, you know, you can replace that with any number of sort of like demi-human characters, like orcs, uh, where you can kill kobolds, it doesn't matter, they're evil, you know? So uh, I think my reaction to that was that conflict isn't really like that. Conflict is about resources. Conflict is about faith. Conflict is about uh, human beings making decisions based on their needs. And so I set out to sort of show a conflict where uh, both sides are actively trying to save the world, but they're just coming at it from such completely different directions that they can't help but come into conflict with each other as a result. Um, because I think that's a lot more ha- like, it, like if there was a big fantasy battle between nations, like, uh, I think that's more how it would happen than just those people are evil and we're not, because that's not how things really are. Um, and so that was a theme that I really wanted to have through the entire series, you know, like, uh, the leaders of the two, these two opposing human forces, like, like their, their belief systems are so diametrically opposed, but they're also friends or, or want to be friends. And they're kind of struggling to have a friendship because their cultures like, uh, uh, offend each other in so many different ways that they don't even realize. That sounds kind of prescient. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was uh, huge in the that's 80s fantasy was, you know, good guy, bad guy, good guy looks good. He's got rippling abs and great hair and the bad guy is wearing black and probably has eyeliner, you know, and mm. very sort of a one sided. Uh, it's almost I mean, you you appear on a especially the demon cycle stuff, like on a lot of the grimdark lists. Uh, even though I, I wouldn't really call it that. Yeah, I, um, I I think that my books have too much hope to be considered yeah. grimdark. I mean, some awful stuff happens in them, and I and I've never felt that like I needed to hold back. Like so, so there's some there's some disturbing shit in there, but I I've never like felt like there was a pervading sense of hopelessness in my books, and that's what I really think grimdark is by definition. Yeah, yeah, Grimdark is more um both sides are evil rather than yeah. both sides are good. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> or it's both sort of sides working to towards something good. Yeah. Um Yeah, there's a nihil but I, I, I think a, nihil, born... a nihilism to true Grimdark, which is why I don't think that Mike Gar- Michael R. Fletcher held up as a uh a shiny example of Grimdark is actually a Grimdark author because his I'm books way aren't too fluffy. Like that. Yeah. No. No, nope. Yeah, um, that actually is really close to what Rob's second question. Was uh, yes, about, he was actually right, asking. Jed? So again, I'll, I'll just quote from Rob directly because otherwise he'll be angry at me for misquoting him. This, his, uh, mm-hmm. he said that Peter's Demon Cycle books are also dark fantasy, high on the grim dark scale. If you ask me, I've heard his new series is a lot lighter and more kind of young adult ish. Could you maybe ask him what it was like to pivot that hard in tone? So first of all, is that is that accurate, or and how would you uh, kind of discuss that uh it's accurate i would say that the the new the nightfall saga is definitely meant to uh reach a broader audience than the demon cycle did and um the but the only real change there is that 
In the demon cycle, the, the characters start out very young, but by the end of the first book, they're all adults. And then sometimes you get like a flashback, like when I want to do backstory on a character and we show them as a kid again. But in the in the now of story time, uh, they're all adults. And so, you know, adults get up to some stuff. <laughs> and uh, in this series, like the characters uh, start out at 15 and like maybe they'll be 16 by the end of it. So like... Uh, they're all sort of uh, too young to be sexually active, you know, which is really the only change. It's still super violent. You know, it's still like uh, has moments that will like be feel like an emotional punch to the gut. And like uh, it's still like I characters still die, you know, like it's, it's, it's no different from a Peter Brett book other than the fact that uh, – it's more like kissing and less like actual and less sex. Um, okay. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and I did that like uh, in part because the warded man with just a couple of tweaks could have been a, a YA book very easily. Um, mm -hmm. And I always sort of wondered now, like, do, what if I'd gone a, that route? You do have a pretty good, a pretty large young audience for those books though, from, from what I've seen, don't you? Uh, define young. Like, I mean, I know that like, 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 well, I've I had... mean, teen, like, uh, I, I'm talking like 18, like 18 yeah. to 20 to 30, which is a young audience. But the um, thing is that like, I, I put out book one in 2008 in the UK and 2009 in the U S and people who were young readers then, you know, the last mm -hmm. book came out in 2017, you know, like, uh, yeah. nine years later. And so like a lot of, a lot of readers have sort of grown up like with me along the course sure. of the series. Um, sure. Yeah. And like, you want to be like, I, I, I want my books to be welcoming to everyone. And if there's a series that's like yeah. a better sort of entry level series, like if you're a younger reader, uh, you can read that and still go back and enjoy the adult books. Like, you know, when you're a little bit older. And so, I've seen a lot of crossover um, with audiences, even though yours is fantasy and his is his sci-fi, um, of in uh, of readers talking about both books, um, Pierce Brown's Red Rising, which they marketed as YA. Um, yeah, but, but it's so not, not all that. I, they grow. I know, I know, but it's actually marketed that way. Um, if you well, look at the, I, when I first, I read the books and then I looked at the, but I read them on ebook. And then when I bought them, I looked at the, at the copy on the back of the first book. And I was like, they're like, they, they're, they were comparing it to, you know, all YA books. And I was like, yeah. wow, that is, that stuff is brutal. <laughs> I mean, just incredibly brutal. Yeah. I mean, no argument. Like Pierce is a friend of mine. I re yeah. I've read those books too. They're fantastic books. I've like, never, I've never met Pierce. Um, a little bit of interaction. And well, Pierce and I are both very, Del Rey authors. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so we met at, at Del Rey events and then, you know, when we see each other at a con or whatever, now we know each other. And so that's how most right. of my professional friendships have, have come. Uh, yep. And so, like, I love those books and, uh, mm -hmm. they have a lot of the hallmarks of a YA book. You know, they're, sh they're the first books at least are, mm -hmm. are pretty short and they, you know, it's just one, mm -hmm. one POV and it's very fast moving and every chapter has a twist and like, it always keeps you like on the edge of your seat. So a lot present, of the, a lot of the present way tense, those books are, are even, set up, uh, yeah. very much goes within the, the sort of YA, you know, fits into the YA genre very well. Um, but you know, as you say, those books are brutal, like really brutal. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. and so while the writing style like fits into that genre, uh, you know, I don't know how many, <laughs> like, but they're my hugely popular, was reading, obviously what? enormously yeah. popular and with look, that crowd. You know, I mean, just enormous or enormously popular. My, my kid was reading hunger games at 12 and like, mm -hmm. it, that's a brutal series too, you know? So, uh, yep. yeah, it, it just goes to show that all of these, uh, genre, uh, 
niches that they try to shove books are just made up by booksellers to try and, you know, nudge you like, oh, you like that? Well, you'll, well maybe yeah. you'll like something in this area. Right. But it's all, it's all guesswork right. and it's all made up. And if you try to write within the rules, you, you just paint yourself into a corner and trip yourself up for no reason. You still have to Absolutely. sort of write the style of book that you want to write. Yeah. And, you know, story and character will dictate some of that. And what you set out to do might end up being not yeah. exactly what it ends yeah, up being. Who, who wants to write the same book over and over again? You know, right. you want to yeah. Yeah. push yourself somewhere different and try something, something new. And Pierce's, Pierce's follow-up series to Red Rising is like clearly adult. And I don't even think they're marketing it, mm -hmm. you know, as anything and very, close to why. Very, very dark. Very dark very and dark. much more, much very more dark complex and story wise. Complex, uh, much grimmer, much less humor, even. Yeah. I mean, there was quite a bit of humor that was thrown in, at least, um, especially with some of the characters like Severo in the, in the first trilogy. But there's just not much <laughs> I'm gonna, in the, in, in the follow up. I'm going to geek out just Go for a second it. about this, you know, uh, because uh, like, <laughs> what I love about the. We, the we never do that. <laughs> what I love about the Red Rising books and then the the uh, oh, I forgot oh. the name of the other trilogy, Dark Age, something like yeah, um the other books are so got, so Red Rising all except the is, last one. Red Rising is like your classic, like uh dystopian YA, like, you know, there's this oppressive force that's you know ruining society and 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 it's keeping us down and we're gonna have a revolution and they have the revolution and and they win. And that's how like all of those series end. But then you never see what happens next because the revolutionaries still need to like take out the trash and make sure the water, you know, there's clean water for the community and like uh, uh, mm -hmm. do all of the bureaucracy of running a government and like realize that there isn't enough money to go around. And, and like the uh, what's so beautiful about this follow up series is that Pierce really gets into that, you know, like, like the, at the end of the first series, like they won. And now that, you know, they don't, now they're in charge. And then in the beginning of the next series, 10 years later, it's like, well, you know, everything's still shit. <laughs> like, um, and people are getting yeah. mad because they thought this revolution was going to change things, but not, not really all that much changed because it's a whole galaxy. And how do you change, you know, like, um, yeah. And it just like I, th I thought it was a brilliant way to, to mature as a writer and and allow your readers to mature with you and say, like, when I was young, I, like this sort of uprising against the, the, you know, the the bureaucracy story really appealed to me. But now that I'm older and I understand nuance and I understand politics and whatever, let's really get into how that would run. I think that's like the real strength of of. There's Pierce's kind of some books. similarities there to what yeah. Abercrombie has done with his Age of Madness trilogy. I think what I appreciated so much about that is how mm -hmm. it really builds upon, you know, like the previous world that he created. And he really asks himself the difficult question of what do these characters look like decades later? What does this world look like when it actually progresses and changes? And it's cool that like we're now getting into the stage where there's a lot of different fantasy books that are doing that, where they're like, creating a sequel series kind of where you can kind of approach it as a new reader. And that's really cool because it's approachable, but also it's set far enough from the original books that you can explore a different side of that world and, and different characters as well. And it sounds like that's sort of what you've been trying to achieve with the Nightfall series, right? Because that is set, um, is that set like quite a time after the original books? 15, 15 years, years later. Yeah. later. So talk us through yeah. like, so that oh, they, they were, are they, in the same world. I yeah. didn't know that. No, so the the demon war ends, uh, and um, at the very end of the book, or the, at the very end of the season, there's like several characters who are pregnant, and like that was very deliberate, um, and like a few of a few of them even give birth in that last book, um, and then because I knew that those characters were going to be the protagonists of this That's smart. future series, and so damn it, uh, the you know that, I jump that's forward. That's what I plan to do with mine. <laughs> Look, you can do it a million. The thing is, that, like, you're not stealing anything if you do that, because there's still a billion different ways <laughs> you could write it, you know, from that point on. Um, sure. But so, like, there's all of the characters are 15 years old. They've never seen a demon, you know, because the demons were all supposedly wiped out. Like, they're, they're 
worldview is completely different from that of their parents. And like one of the things that I like to explore in fantasy series is like, you know, that the protagonist always had some sort of like uh, difficulty at home, you know, or like parents weren't there, parents were abusive, this or that. And that sort of like leads them on the path to becoming something special. Um, and so I thought it was interesting to show how even the, like the heroes of the previous series can screw up as parents um, and how that can, you know, have that same, well, I guess I got to go on an adventure effect on your kids that it did on them, even though they avoided all of the mistakes of their parents, you know? Every generation fucks their kids up in a way. In another book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to steal that line wholesale in your book, Mike. Um, <laughs> That'd be a winner. <laughs> yeah, keep going, Peter. Sorry. Uh, so I, I just like, I thought that that was like something really interesting and fun that I wanted to explore. Um, and I change the cast around and, and cast off a lot of the baggage of like, okay, I have all of these characters in the previous series that like their stories have already been told. And like, I guess I could make up new ones, but like when I created the character, this was their story and that has been told. Um, uh -huh. And so it was nice to start with a fresh batch of characters and sort of get to build again. What advice would you give to people who have maybe written a first series that has been decent and they are thinking about doing something like this? They are thinking about doing a kind of sequel series that is set in the same world, maybe with different characters, maybe with some sort of time jump. Uh, I, I, it depends on what they're feeling really passionate about. Um, it depends on how they feel about that previous series of their own. Uh, I think that there is an increasing baggage that comes with writing a long series or writing connected series. I thought that I was dropping a lot of the baggage by changing all the protagonists and sort of starting to get to have new characters. But what I've realized over the course of writing it is that as they travel from place to place, because these are places that I've already established and places that already have an established supporting cast, like there's still a lot of baggage that I, I didn't realize was still there. Um, and it gets it, it gets to weigh on you in ways that you don't realize it when, you know earlier in the series, like how it will come to to start to drag. Um, and even if your readers don't notice it, you as a writer will notice it, and it's exhausting. Um, and so I think that there's real value in taking a chance and doing something that's different. Um, and I myself am like have a little secret project that is just that is exactly that. Um, because I think that it's healthy to grow as a writer to, to not get stuck in a rut. Um, but that said, every series is different and every writer is different and you have to be prepared to make your own choices about what you think, uh, is the best career choice for you and what you think is, is the, is the choice that will make you most creatively proud of yourself, you know, or, or satisfied. Um, so it's hard to answer a question like that for everyone. And I, I, I love that, that none of those, none of your answers or elements of it have anything to do with, with, uh, hoping people love it and, and more people buy my book. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, we all hope that, but. Yeah. If you start to approach your craft from that angle, I think you you uh, inevitably inevitably shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, you know, there are marketing geniuses who don't really care about their craft, I guess, but I don't really know any of them. Um, I think the people I, that, that I know. I know a few who say, this is really popular. I'm going to write one of these. And they write a really fucking good one. And it is really popular. And I'm like, God damn it. But, you know, these, these, they're, they're very few and far between. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some people are just really, really good that way. And, and I the, think the vast majority of us are not. And it would be impossible for me to make myself write a book just because it would be popular. I would have to have an idea that really, really appealed to me because it's just too fucking hard to write books yeah. otherwise yeah. for me. 
<laughs> I, like there, there are people. I mean, they 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 crank out eight ten thousand words a day, and they're good words. And I hate that that they can do that, but they can do it. And so they just you keep know, going. there's there's it's talkative crazy. people and there's quiet people, and the, and then there's writers who just you know have enormous output, and then others who just have to think, have a long think and do it a little bit at a time. And I've always been a yeah. like long think and a little bit at a time guy. It takes me, you know, I, I put out the demon cycle books once every other year. So mm-hmm. probably, uh, 15 months to write it and then editing and production. Um, and so I, I can't knock out a book in three months, like some authors can, yeah. like I cannot do that. It is not possible for me to do that. And so if I'm going to devote 15 months of my brain's process, creative processing power to a project, like I better want to do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, but it's, but some people, you know, it's like the way some people can pick up other languages because they're just naturally talkative people and they have no shame about making mistakes. And so they just practice, practice, practice and, and pick it up really quickly. And those of us who are not as talkative uh, really struggle to learn new languages uh writing is weird yeah i mean people people are different which is right yeah. and that sums it That's up the writing the episode, is right weird there. yeah well, yeah what works for one person just won't work for somebody else because it's all how your mike brain is works pretty, M- M- mike is pretty prolific but he only writes books that he absolutely wants to write he does not give a shit otherwise but you work <laughs> really fast well. which, right? which also like, yeah, I mean, I can not quite to a year, but I can kind of put out like a a book every eight months, eight to ten months. Sure. Um, you know, like I, I can bang out a first draft in three or four months, but it's it's a cluster fuck. Like it, <laughs> I, I will then spend four months, you know, unfucking the book uh, <laughs> that I wrote. You know, yeah. so it's you know, it goes. It's like yes, the first draft can be fairly fast sometimes. Um, but the faster my first draft is, the more time I spend editing. So how, how long is your average If I slow down, uh, seems to be like 110, 120,000 words. So, so, so not, not, they're not books, uh, you know, doorstops kind of thing. My, my books average like two thirty. So, uh, (laughs) you know, I guess it's like twice the, you double that time anyway. Um, yeah, my last. The last book in the Paternus trilogy is 235, and I thought that would kill me because the first one's 125, second one's 135. And I thought, oh, maybe 170, 180 for the third one. Nope. And uh, add that extra 53,000 words or 55,000 words. I, I uh, kill me. I sold the, the first, uh, the Desert Prince, the first Nightfall book. Uh, I sold it like as a 120,000 word book. And it is, oh boy. it is 220. Um, I just like, <laughs> I, I think that just like, this is how I write. I naturally sort of yeah. sprawl out and, and tell like a, like a very detailed, like sort of emotional story where you're really in the, in with the characters and, and feeling what they're feeling. And, and like, and I sort of, that's just the nature of how I mm. put a book together. And so, uh, even trying to write shorter books, like it's, <laughs> I naturally expand. There's something yeah. actually quite liberating about giving yourself the permission to write longer because yeah, I used to write quite short novels that were around maybe like 80,000 or something like that. And then I wrote a game, which was, I want to do like that. 280,000 so words, <laughs> which was insane to me and took like two years of my life. And now I seem to have lost the ability to write short. And my current book is like barely halfway through, but, it's already, you know, like past the 80,000 word mark or whatever. So, but it's actually kind of a nice place to be because you're like, oh, I can, I, I can have these characters, you know, explore these emotions and go off and have this moment that maybe I would feel the pressure to like cut it in a longer, in a shorter book. And then of course you can always in the editing, like trim it back down, hack it back down. But it's kind of nice to give yourself that space for characters to really develop and, and kind of breathe. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of the, you know, the, again, this is a reaction to 80,000 word, like Forgotten Realms novels or whatever that I consumed in vast quantities in, in, in the eighties and nineties, uh, yep. that, um, 
you know, the, the supporting cast would have these like story arcs of their own, but they were always told in like a sentence here and a sentence there. And, you know, sure. like, uh, yeah. You know, you're reading like the Belgariad and like there's like a little aside about how like, oh, Silk went off and got up to some shit because one reason or another. <laughs> and like uh, it's meant to to make those supporting characters seem more rounded, but it, 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 it was always done in a very like, you know, here's a quick line about it. Um, and so when you're when you allow yourself to sprawl a little bit, you can really sort of get into the stories of the supporting cast the same way that like you would get involved in your friend's problems. Like, you know, your main character can get involved in supporting cast problems. And, and like, it just, it humanizes the whole story in a way that uh, is nice if you have the space and the time to do that. Awesome. Well, I think this is a, a good place to put a pin in this conversation. Uh, and this is sort of part one because uh, Peter will be joining us for next week's episode. So um, yeah, make sure you subscribe if you haven't done that already. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks again for Peter, Peter for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. As we end this episode, I wanted to give a big shout out to our patrons who help support the show and an extra special shout out to our legendary wizard patrons, Talon and Daniel. If you want to help support the show and get access to a huge library of uh, exclusive patron only episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash wizards words. You can find the link in the show notes below.